why is it necessary for us to reclaim our families, our homes, and our children for God? Why? Why should we? Why should we do that? I want to begin today's uh, session by discussing two things with you. One has to do with the why. Why do we need to, in fact, reclaim our families and our homes for God? And what does Lent have to do with it? When it comes to reclaiming our homes and our families for God, here are the objectives. Here are the reasons why we need to be about the business of working to reclaim our families for God. First of all, to align the family and home to the divine plan of God, thereby creating a climate for the supernatural intervention of God. All of us would like for God to intervene, to participate, to be a part of our families. There are times when sickness comes, there are times when trouble hits, there are times when things will occur that we do not even understand, there are times we need only God can do it for us. And so as we align our families with the will and purposes of God, it becomes easy for God to intervene. The second thing about this business of reclaiming our families and our homes for God is to educate, to empower, and to equip the family to make productive contributions to enhance the quality of life. Nobody wants to bring a child into this world that ends up in prison, that ends up on some street corner doing drugs and selling drugs and destroying the lives of others. I don't know of any parent who decided, let's bring a child into this world and let them be so ineffective that they are destructive. No, it's just the opposite. And so we, we want to reclaim our families. We want to reclaim our children to educate them, to empower them, to equip them so that the family, this family can make a productive contribution to enhance the quality of life. When the family's name is mentioned, everybody can say, yes, we know that family. That family is about making a difference in society. That family is making a difference in whatever institution that they are a part of. What's another reason why we need to reclaim the family and our children for, for God. Thirdly, to ensure that individual members of the family are taught the things of God so as to fulfill the plan of God for their lives. Someone said that the two most important things to know is the day you are born and the reason why you are born. And so as we reclaim the family and our children for God, then it becomes easy for us to teach them the plan of God, the purpose of God for their lives. One of the things I always keep in the back of my mind is that one of these days, we may not be around for our children. But wouldn't it be marvelous and wonderful that when that day comes, that our children would have been so empowered, so educated, so enriched that they're able to carry on with the help of God, with the power of God? Yes, that's why we have to reclaim our families and our children for God. We've just come out of the season of Lent. How does Lent play a role in this discussion that we are dealing with? We know that Lent is the spiritual discipline 
of fasting, of prayer, of meditation, of worship, and the study of God's word for the purpose of alignment or aligning our will with the will of God. Lent is not just about Easter egg hunt and uh, it's not just about early morning uh, 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 sunrise service. It's not just about holding revival services. No. Those are only means. They are strategies. The real reason for Lent is so that we are able to align our will to the will of God so that we know what God's plans are, what God's purposes are for our life. Lent, on the other hand, is the display of God's unconditional love. Lent is the display of God's unconditional love. Lent is also God's grace extended to him a kind for our salvation, for our reconciliation, and for our fellowship with God. Lent. Unconditional love, an opportunity for our salvation, reconciliation, and fellowship with God. But there is a flip side to this thing called Lent. And what is that flip side? Lent is also God's absolute demonstration of his anger, his hate, and his wrath against sin, against disobedience, against rebellion. If you really want to know how God hits sin, how God hits rebellion, how God hits disobedience, look at what happened on the cross. Suffering God's only begotten son, suffering and dying, it is actually God's demonstration of how he does not like anything close to aligned with disconnected to sin, rebellion, and disobedience. God hits it. And God hits it so much that he will not allow it to continue, whether in earth or in heaven. And so God does what? He makes a way. He provides a way. So Lent is God's process for creating an opportunity for us to live a life of obedience to God's commandments, a life of holiness, a life of love a life of faith, a life of hope, and a life with the understanding that the best is yet to come. As I said to you, one of the things that uh, I'm learning out of this past Lent season is that in some instances, we need to readjust our thinking about this God business. And especially when it comes to the spiritual disciplines of fasting, of prayer, of meditation, worship, reading God's word, etc. What God is teaching me, and I want to pass that on to you, is that it is all about our fellowship, our relationship to him is all about our fellowship, our relationship to him. When that fellowship, when that relationship is what it ought to be, my sisters and my brothers, you are ready to live life to its highest. Listen to the words of God. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. 
and everything will be added unto you. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Listen to the word of God. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Why? Because you love God and you are executing the purposes of God. And when you love God and you are executing the purposes of God, guess what? He will make even your enemies to be at peace with you. God is showing me something here. The real key to your absolute blessings, the real key to your absolute victory is in the relationship, the fellowship that you have with God. When God is the primary objective of your life, when fellowship with God supersedes any other desires, it is then and only then you are ready to experience all of God's blessings, all, all of God's provisions, all of God's protections, all of God's presence in your life. Listen to the word. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It is all about our relationship to God. Why do you think God said, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their cry, I will hear their prayers, and I will heal the land. It is about our relationship to God. Don't forget that. Don't forget the reason why we want to reclaim our families, our children, and our homes for God. And don't forget why Lent is such an important part of the process of bringing us back to God. And that's the reason why I believe a mother's teaching is so vital in the life of a man. We want to talk about a mother's teaching. As you know, and I say this all the time, women are so important to the life of godliness. Women are so essential to the life of the church, of godliness. Women are so important when it comes to a man becoming truly a man and accomplishing everything God intended for his life. I say this all the time. A woman didn't just show up on planet Earth because she wanted to. A woman appeared on planet Earth because God said it is not good for a man to be alone. And that's not just about romantic intimacy relation. No, it's simply the fact that mankind, man, M-A-N, cannot make it on this Earth to accomplish what God intended for him by himself. A man needs help. Every day, any day, a man needs help. And so men who have a problem with women, they really seriously have a problem with God. That's number one. Number two, I know that sometimes we argue whether it is beside every great man is a great woman or whether it is behind or whatever the case may be. What I do know is that mother or women 
have been extremely essential to the greatness of most men who have made it. One of these days, uh, probably we're thinking about doing that sometimes uh, during the period of uh, uh, when we're about to celebrate Mother's Day. We want to just show you many, many of the great men in the world how it was a woman that helped them become what they became. They didn't just make it by themselves. You know, uh, for example, we all take glory and pride in uh, that prophetic speech by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, I have a dream speech. Really, it was a woman who encouraged him. You know, he was about to give another speech. And the lady said, Dr. King, do the I have a dream speech. She encouraged him. And he made that particular speech. And as you well know, the rest is history. Henry Ford with the Ford automobile. You know who really inspired him and encouraged him to go on and get it done? His wife. And the list could go on and on about the significance of a woman in the life of a man. And so I say to you, in the life of your sons, mothers, don't take your role lightly. Uh, wives, in the life of your husbands, do not take lightly your role as a woman. If you see your husband about to do something crazy, you need to speak up. Don't be afraid that he will stop doing this and stop doing that for you. God will provide. God brought you. God can keep you. But if you see your spouse, if you see your husband, if you see a significant other about to do something crazy, speak up. You see, what sometimes men don't understand, women have a way of determining what is going on even before we can even calculate it. There is something about a woman that is genuinely, astronomically outstanding. Women are tremendously, powerfully interesting creatures that God made. And please, you are not just here to be here. God put you here for a reason. Whether it is in the institution, whether it is in the family, whether it's in the community, you know, we love to talk about uh, the Montgomery bus boycott there in the United States of America in a place called Alabama. But do you know who really engineered that bus boycott? It was the women. Beginning with Rosa Parks. With the women who made the flyers to put all over the place. Women. Oh, I pray the day with women will stand up again to save Africa, to save our communities, to save our families, because there is a conspiracy. There is a conspiracy to ensure that we do not rise to the height of what we are supposed to be. And I believe with all my heart, it's gonna take the combined role of women and men May I just be very candid? It's going to take the combined will and power of both women and men to work together to save this world of ours. The teachings of a mother to her son. I want to use for our scripture, as we began on yesterday, Proverbs chapter 31, talking about the teachings of a mother 
to a son. And then once we go through it, I want us to see if we can pick out what was it this mother was trying to achieve through her teaching of her son. And I want to use the Message Bible because the Message Bible tends to talk in the language of our day today. It says here, Proverbs chapter 31, the words of King Lemuel, the strong advice his mother gave him. O oh, son of mine, what can you be thinking of? Child whom I bore, the son I dedicated to God, don't dilute your strength on fortune hunting women, promiscuous women who shipwreck leaders. Leaders can't afford to make fools of themselves, gulping wine and, and swilling beer. Less hung over, they don't know right from wrong. And the people who depend on them are hurt. Use wine and beer only as a sedative to kill the pain and dull the ache of the terminally ill for whom life is a living death. Speak up for the people whom, who you have no, who have no voice, for the rights of all the misfits. Speak out for justice. Stand up for the poor and destitute. A good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. A husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all her life long. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoy knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails so to far away places and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field and buys it. Then with money, she puts aside, plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work, is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and earth diligent in home making. She, she's quick to assist anyone in need, reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. Their winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linen and skills, silks. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. She designs gowns and sells them, brings the sweaters she knits to the dress shops. Her clothes are well made and elegant and she always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say. And she always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household. 
and keeps them all busy and productive. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades the woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Adorn her life with praises. This is a mother talking to her son. On yesterday, when we were asking the question and asking, what do you, what have you been teaching your sons? And typically, uh, the conclusive words were that I'm teaching my son to be respectful. I'm teaching my son to uh, fear God. I'm teaching my son to be one who uh, will work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in this particular advice given to Lemuel by his mother, if you will notice, it is about whom he will spend his life with. The spouse, the woman, that he will spend his life with. Because if the woman is not the right type for him, it can be very disastrous. And so she talks about how he is supposed to live, what he is supposed to do, and then the kind of woman he should have in his life. For example, he, she says, oh, son of mine, what can you be thinking of? Child whom I bore, the son I dedicated back to God. It is important to dedicate our children back to God. She says, don't dilute your strength on fortune hunting women, promiscuous women who shipwreck leaders. You know, when you think about it, a woman can make a man and a woman can break a man down. A woman can deliver a man and a woman can destroy a man. So the first conversation I want us to have, what is it that produces this kind of a woman who is about the business of simply fortune hunting, promiscuous, and is ready to shipwreck a leader. How did such a woman come to be? Again, it then becomes very critical. And I think that's what uh, Lemuel's mother is doing here, is to equip him with the knowledge of how to choose. Because the truth is, all of our lives, all of our lives come down to choices, the decisions that we make. And so we've heard here today that this uh, fortune hunting woman, a woman who is promiscuous, who shipwrecks uh, leaders, has evolved not out of 
a simplistic understanding, but in some very complicated processes. As we've heard, our first speaker, Sister Andrew said, people do what people see. Then we also heard that at times the environment is wonderful, but then one does very well, another does just the opposite. Then we also heard the need to dedicate our children back to God. We also heard that there are times when you have this family out there. I mean, just the opposite of everything. On the weekend, the house becomes a casino with liquor, drinking, and everything else. But then the child out, out of that home ends up becoming somewhat of a paragon of virtue. And so there are a lot of reasons why such a thing can happen. Let's just look at it from another way. Imagine if this fortune hunting woman, promiscuous, can shipwreck a leader. Imagine if this fortune hunting woman, promiscuous, who has the ability to shipwreck a leader was controlled by the right spirit, by the right teaching, by the right words, by the right environment. Can you imagine if for the lack of she's able to cause a shipwreck in the life of a leader. Imagine if that same woman had been introduced to the saving knowledge. This is the reason why we need to, or one of the reasons why we need to really reclaim and redeem our homes and our families for God. Because the enemy knows their potential. He knows what we are capable of. And he doesn't want us to achieve and accomplish all that God intends for us. And so really, the woman is only an instrument of demonic activities, someone called the generational curse. So when a family does not learn how to uh, uh, identify the works of the enemy, when a family is not taught how to break generational curses, then they become, you know, our family are carpenters. And so every member of the family is a carpenter. Our families are known for what we do. And so the enemy uses us continuously. And so there is no one answer to the evolution of a fortune hunting woman who is promiscuous and will shipwreck a leader, except for the fact that this same woman has the potential the capability, the capacity to do great things, except that without proper boundaries, proper instructions, proper upbringing, proper environment. We heard earlier about one who went off and the next time you saw her, she was like 10 years older. Again, without the proper environment, without the proper care, cultivation, et cetera, the enemy can use 
any one of us to do something strange. You know, when what was said, when I think it must have been Sister Camille talking about, you know, the family doing everything well, and then somebody goes off and do something interesting. I was thinking about Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel came out of the same house, came out of the same womb. One killed the brother. Esau and Jacob. So what we need to be mindful of, especially when it comes to our girls, is to really, really teach them the ways of God. And our men also. Because a woman can either build a family or she can tear it down. A woman can either build up a man or can bring him down by the values, the virtues, and the vision she has for life. And so the first thing Lemuel's mother taught him was about the kind of woman he should have in his life. And so we recommend to you mothers, if you're going to teach your sons, one of the first lessons is the lesson around the kind of woman he should entertain in his life. Oh, what if many of us men had that kind of a teaching? Maybe, just maybe, living would be quite different. <laughs>